Hey, watch and listen fans, a quick heads up. The first few minutes of the show did not record video due to a technical issue. Uh, we fixed that, and yes, we know the angle of the shot once we got it fixed is not yet perfect, but we're working on it, and it should be resolved for the next episode. We're really excited about that. And as always, thank you for your support. Here's our interview with none other than Magnus Walker. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a uh, finally a fully functional and stable watch and listen podcast. At least for the time being. <laughs> yeah, At least for, for the now. time. We've been having some tef- technical difficulties, but we're getting through it. We will persevere. Happy there Mondays. will be an episode. Yes, yeah, we're, we're here. We're doing yes. it. Thank you very much, Magnus Walker, for having the patience to deal with us here and also for coming out uh, and bringing us your amazing collection of watches that we're going to take a look at. Well, you at. haven't seen them yet. So well, you're, not, you're not sure how amazing they may or may not be, but uh, I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. We've seen we've seen the documentaries on you. We've seen the Urban Not Law. We've seen you know you you're you're Man not with a beard, right? Okay, yeah, we'll we'll leave it at that. Cameron, at that. welcome back to the show. Man with a baby yeah. beard over here. Cameron yeah. to my left. <laughs> I'm working a bit. on it. I'm working That's on it. good stuff. <laughs> okay, well if he's got baby beard, what do I have? Peach fuzz. <laughs> Five o'clock shadow. Five o'clock shadow. Okay, fair. That's fair. All right, so we uh, were talking about your Omega Speedmaster before we had a. Is it a, Omega a, or Omega? I don't tomato, know. Tomato, tomato, depends, Porsche, Porsche. Right? Depends where you're from. I don't yeah. know. I think Omega yeah. is, uh, like, more universal across the world. But uh, over is here it? in the U.S., most people are saying Omega, right? That's right. Right, yeah. I've heard every British person say Omega. Yeah. I've heard, like, Jeremy Clarkson, for example, when he wears How he say? Omega. He says Omega. It's a little bit like that watch you have. It's aluminum, really, right? Yeah. Or is it aluminum? Yeah. Uh, aluminum. Should they we get back to the own. Speedmaster? <laughs> we should. We we should. should. Let's, let's yes, get back to the right. Speedmaster. Right? Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about your Speedmaster. I'm going to go ahead and show it here on uh, there, you go, there you go. The show that guy. There you go. So this it's not is the current the... time. I didn't even bother setting it. I haven't worn it in I don't know how many years since. Uh, basically, the the, the, P, the Porsche design watch took over from the Speedmaster. I always say it's Porsche time. But the interesting part to the Speedmaster story, I suppose it was the first serious watch that I bought that wasn't uh-huh. a Swatch or a Timex or something like that. And I bought it. I want to buy a watch down on Melrose when these things were super affordable. But the real interesting part to the um, Omega Speedmaster, which I used to call the Thinking Man's Rolex, <laughs> in Tamir Muscovici's 2012 film, you know, of an outlaw, I wear the watch in that film. And uh, my cousin in England had sent me an email after the film came out, basically saying, hey, there's a whole thread on some watch talk blog about what watch you're wearing in the film. And I sort of had to scratch my head and go, I don't even see the watch in the film. But there's one scene in it where I'm driving my Irish Green 66 911 coming out of the LA River under the bridge. I've got my hand on the big wood rim steering wheel. And you can sort of see the watch in the shot. So it just sort of made me think at that point, you know, humans like to collect. I always say people like to collect, whether sure. it's cards, watches, guitars, stamps, whatever it may be, art. You know, currently I'm on a collecting crystals binge. But it was just fascinating to me how long this thread was about, you know, what reference it is. And I go... What do you mean? It's a Speedmaster. What does reference mean? And it's funny, you know, my father was a watch guy growing up. He actually um, went back to, I suppose, university or college, you know, in the 70s and got a degree in horological studies, believe wow. it or not. Wow. And set up his own little business repairing clocks and watches. So we always had, you know, stuff around the house. I grew up working class in Sheffield, north of England. My dad was really more of a clock guy than a watch guy. So there was always, you know, a bunch of stuff that was, you know, taken apart, not put back together. It's like the cobbler's shoe syndrome, I guess. You know, we didn't have cuckoo clocks, but we had grandfather clocks, grandmother clocks, you know. There was always, like, a lot of ticking going on and, you know. I bet. Stuff like that. But you never had anything sort of, I guess, there were no Rolexes, you know. I might have had a Hamilton or something like that. But um, I suppose my love affair of watches, other than trying to be always on time and punctual, (laughs) probably comes from the fact that, my dad was a watch guy, but never had anything flash or fancy. You know, I think people like watches for a lot of different reasons. You know, obviously for some people it's a status symbol, I guess. For me, it's just I'm drawn to things that are aesthetic or for some reason have an attraction to me. But generally, it's kind of like the cars. You know, it's got to look good to begin with or somehow I have to be attracted to that piece. You sure. know? And for me, there's a big sort of, you know, are you a Rolex guy or – Omega guy, it's a little bit like guitars. Are you a Fender guy or are you a Gibson guy? Are you a Porsche guy or a Ferrari guy, right? It kind of does break down a little bit into that. Obviously, there's a million var- variations and subgenres of, you know, what makes people tick when it comes to watches and, you know, why some things are like five bucks and some things are five million bucks or 18 million bucks if it's a 
you know, Paul Newman, Rolex Daytona, whatever it may be, right? right. Ultimately, these are all pieces of time. So right. there's a long-winded answer to uh, Omega Speedmaster. Okay, so when you were, follow-up question to that. So when you were at Wanna Buy a Watch, what made you look for the Omega? Or why, why did you buy the Omega? I'm going to do the British pronunciation for the <laughs> rest of the show, by the way. Interestingly, my uncle David, growing up, he was sort of like the cool uncle. And he had a Rolex. He had a GMT. He might have had a Submariner. Submariner never had a Daytona. For me, I was never a Rolex guy. I always sort of liked Omega. I think it was a man on the moon, you know, thing that attracted me to it. I just, I just, I guess I like, I love the way it looked and I like the fact that it wasn't a Rolex. Okay. So that attracted me to it. It'd been a watch on my list. You know, my thing with watches is kind of the same, like from a collecting point of view, I just collect what I personally like, whether it's guitars, cars, watches, gemstones, whatever it is. And my timing has always been, I buy what I like when I like it, and then later on these things become desirable and worth more than they were when I first got them. Okay. That was how I ended up obtaining a lot of early Porsches because when I got into them 20, 25 years ago, Porsches, and we'll get to that whole story later on, but they were readily available and they were affordable. The Omega Speedmaster sort of ticked that same box. You know, I okay. think it's a little bit different now. I don't monitor the, the watch market, but you know, what I paid for it and what it is today are two different things, but that wasn't why I bought it. It was just obtainable. I like the look of it. I like the connection to, uh, obviously, uh, the land, first man on the moon, and that's kind of the Speedmaster story. And I like things with patina. I have no interest in box and papers. You know, that doesn't mean anything to me. It's the same with cars. Like When people show me cars that have got, oh, my buddy's got a car with 50 miles on it, I've got no interest. Yeah. Show me your buddy's car with 500,000 miles <laughs> on it, a bunch of dings and chips and patina and character. i got all the interest in the world with that. Right. So, you know, scratches and nicks, and they're all part, memorable moments or part of the story of the car, the guitar, the watch, or whatever it may be. And so for me, you know, I don't, I don't separate the two. You know, I like things with character and soul. And I always talk about that from a car point of view, but I think the watch is the same thing. They develop over time, right? You know, there's right. a history to it. So um, I'm rambling on, but Omega Speedmaster. No, no, no. Rambling on is good. Rambling Ramble on, on is really That's good. That's what I do. So, so I have a – oh, go ahead. I got go a question ahead. for that. Yeah. Everything used, you, you bought pretty much every watch would be used then, right? Yeah, I've never owned a new watch. There you go. Okay. Ever. Uh, I mean, I guess when I was a kid, I had a Timex or a, I remember when Swatch came out. When was that, late 70s, early 80s? Yeah. And then there's another one that had like a, I have one, I didn't bring it. It was a, some Swiss thing, inexpensive watch. Hmm. Had an outer black, uh, it was a black plastic watch with an outer bezel that was interchangeable. The bezel came in different mm -hmm. colors. So, but yeah, I've never, maybe I bought a new watch when I was a kid, but I've never bought a new watch since. Yeah, so mainly gravitating towards the. I don't like anything new. I, I've never owned a new car. I never owned a new, well, Take that back. I recently bought a new guitar, a okay. new, new guitar. You know, my whole life revolves around this phone. I actually don't own a computer. I don't own a laptop, but everything is done on this phone, everything. I just booked a flight to New York this morning on the phone. So anyway, I've like, got too much time on my hands. I'm in New York. I'm, I love walking around, you know. i got to live up to my last name. Last year, I tried to average <laughs> 10,000 steps. I got to like 9,850, so I'm always walking around and, I got a place in New York and by coastal dating this beautiful girl, Hannah Elliott, and we've got an apartment in New York together. So I'm always walking around for some reason. I'm sat in the park. I'm just flicking through and I see this um, ad, you know, for a new, uh, I'm looking at guitars and Gretsch. I see these new Gretches. Are you a guitar guy? I am not. But I, I, I am not a guitar. I'm, I'm a drummer. Okay. But so you got rhythm. My brother, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. Uh, my brother actually is a, is a guitar player and okay. a huge guitar guy. He's got a collection himself. So, when I hear Gretsch, I'm like, okay, right. hollow so, body? Ho of course, okay. hollow body. You know, I'm looking white falcon, you know, of course. But I start seeing these Gretsches that are made overseas, you know, that the made in Korea or China, but they're like $399, mm -hmm. $499, hollow body, Bigsby Whammy Bar. And I go, oh, it's new, but I always wanted one. And vintage ones are kind of expensive. Right. You know, like three grand and up. I didn't really want to go down that. I didn't want to dive that deep straight away into a Gretsch guitar. So I have an expression I say it all the time, how bad can it be? So I buy <laughs> one for $4.99, Bixby Whammy Bar, it's candy apple red. It arrives in a big box like two days later. I guess it's a beautiful thing about the internet, right? You can Instant gratification, it arrives, mm -hmm. you know, two days later. I pull it out of the box, I go, I strum a chord, I go, oh, it's brand new. I, I, I didn't really like it. 
straight away. So I didn't play it for a couple of weeks. Then I picked it up again. The more I played it, the more I sort of got into it and really started to enjoy it. But that's the only new thing I've bought is a really inexpensive hollow body Gretsch, which actually sounds really good. And for the money, it's obtainable. So I'm yeah. also about things being obtainable. Okay. Back to the Porsches being inexpensive, right. you know, back in the day. And they're still inexpensive. There's a Porsche for every price point. I recently bought a $5,000 running driving 2004 996. You know, and to some people, this is the most unloved 911. It's the first water-cooled 911. The 996 is the unloved ugly headlight. You can't have a 996 conversation without someone trying to tell you all about <laughs> IMS bearing <laughs> failure. You know, and I don't look for stuff. Stuff finds me. People shoot me emails all the time. And I'd actually put a little ad out there, wanted 996 Gen 1 Aero kit car, 99. Guy sends me an email. He goes, I know this is not what you're looking for, but I'll practically give it to you for free. I go, what is it? He goes, it's an 04, uh, you know, Gen 2 996. I go, well, how much is practically free? And generally this car is probably in the, the teens and they're going up kind of, you know, quickly. He goes, well, I'll give it to you for five grand. So my first question is, does it run? He goes, yeah. I go, second question, mechanically, what does it need? He goes, mechanically, it actually doesn't need anything. He goes, it's repainted in the original color, slate gray. The paint not great. The paint's not great and it's got 150,000 miles on it or something. I go, I'll buy it. How bad can this thing be? So, you know, to me, a lot of what I collect and watches fall into that category. They have to be obtainable. They have to be usable. I've never been that guy that owns something that you don't want to drive it or you don't want to wear it. Or It's like we'll get into this Porsche design watch in a minute, but mm -hmm. when I first got it, it was mint. Now, you know, you see what's going yeah. on here. Yeah, It's no longer mint. So take a look at that one. Well, Let's I was going to say that watches. about this Omega. I mean, this is a very well-worn. We like to call it, or at least I like to call it, well-worn. Yeah, well, you see, I never took that watch off. The only time I'd take it off is when I take a bath, and I do take a bath all the time. But, you know, I'd be wearing it all the time when I was working on cars. You know, and back then in that period, I was sort of building a lot more cars than I'm doing now. So it would always get nicked, you know. You bang it against the corner of a door or a table or something, right? So I was never that guy that took the watch off to go work on the car. I kept the watch on. So it got dinged up, and, you know, you, you look around the bezel and the case, you know, to me... I like things that way, like mm -hmm. your favorite pair of old jeans or your leather jacket when it's broken in. You know, so to me, it's uh, that's the way I like things. It's a, it's a comfortable thing, I think, for me to have something that's that I don't have to worry about dinging. It's the same with cars. You know, today I drove down. I've got a real early 1978 928. It's the first year of the 928. You know, I'm driving. I'm literally driving here. I haven't driven the car in a couple of days. I've got something else that I was driving recently. I go... I'll just take that because I didn't want to pull a car out of the garage, and I really like the car. It's silver pasture interior. So I'm driving. I'm on the 10 heading through downtown West again on the 110. There's a truck in front of me drives over a cone, like a big orange cone. It's literally like in the middle of the freeway, and I have nowhere to go, literally nowhere to go, so I drove over it. <laughs> I go, oh, I just drove over a cone. It's obviously a rubber cone, bright orange. Didn't make any damage or it didn't even mark the car, but it's one of those things that, you know, some people might have got really upset and flustered about that. You know, yeah. a few years ago, I have a very early 75 turbo right-hand drive car. Porsche only made 284 turbos in 75, and only 32 of them were right-hand drive. I bought this car in Australia. It was God's Red. Shipped it to L.A. My buddy, uh, Matt Baum, painted it across the road in downtown in my shop, and uh, it's copper-brown metallic now. So I'm doing a story with Total 911 uh, about the history of the turbo, and we're driving both. I have two 75 turbos. One's left-hand drive, one's right-hand drive. And these are pretty rare to have one, but have a pair is even rarer of left and right and drive. The car is just finished, copper brown metallic. I got my favorite road, Angeles Crest Highway. I always like to run my turbos on soft, sticky Hoosiers. Paints mint because it's literally fresh paint. And I don't really like fresh paint because it's too shiny. Anyway, here's a moral to the story. We're ripping up the canyon, sticky rubber. It had rained a few days before. And what that means in the crest is a lot of grit, a lot of gravel, a lot of rocks. Right. We pull over and literally the whole rear fenders are pitted, pebble dashed, you know, rock chipped. And the guy from Total 911, my buddy Lee Sibley, he goes, oh, I'm really sorry about that. He wasn't driving the car, hmm. but we were doing the show. I go, no, it doesn't matter to me. That's all part of the story of the car. So for me, nothing is ever perfect. Nothing needs to be perfect. And I think a lot of times people strive for perfection and it's, it's, it's kind of, for me, not that important. 
whether the cars mint, the watches mint, the guitars mint, the character and soul, and those are all parts of the story. You know, I actually like telling the story of that turbo getting rocked. Right. I have the the same thing. I had a brand new uh, Mercedes van that I built out into a camper. First trip, I take it up to Big Sur, and I had this road that I wanted to to go on, way up over the mountains, off road. Yeah. In this van that's brand new, and we're going up this thing. Scratches all down the side of the van. Trees hanging down. Yeah. <laughs> scratching the whole low hanging fruit. Then I go around this turn, and the thing starts to tip over. All of my water jugs go to one side. There's water pouring down the floor, out the side door, and my wife is freaking out. <laughs> and I'm just like, you know what? We, it doesn't matter. This is great. We're going to have all these scratches down the side of the car. It's going to happen. You won't be worried about it. You know, the, the next story. tiny road we right. hit. But this story, you gotta every, break time, it in somehow. every time we get in the van, we think about this. Right. When we almost tipped over going through this road and got all these scratches, it's a good memory. It's a memorable moment. Yeah. And I talk about those things all the time. My turbo hunter got sort of rock chipped in the crest. That memorable moment wouldn't have existed. Some people may go, well, your paint would look better. I go, well, that don't really slow me down. Yeah. And I have this saying, right. do it, don't slow you down. Right. Rock but you're more concerned it. about the drive, the experience of the drive, yeah, than you me, are the look of the it's drive. It's all about the experience. You know, the drive is definitely a way of connecting with the car, the sensory overload. But it's a connection with any any object, right? You know, the watch, the guitar, the crystal, uh, the emotional thing that comes up. These are things that, um, you know, you can't really plan or manufacture. They just evolve. They just happen. I've got right. a lot of stories like that. Most of them involve driving, drove across Australia. You know, I've been down in Colombia driving. So, you know, there's a plan and then, you know, you got to adapt a little bit like this morning with the podcast, right? With sure. the technical yeah. difficulties, yeah. right? Well, life Show goes must on, go on, right? Yeah. Life goes on. Life so goes you, on for you sure. got to get done what yeah. you need to get done. But So on, on this watch, mm -hmm. as soon as you showed it to me, the first thing I saw was all the, the PVD on the side of it. Right. Just from, you know, going the jacket going over it right. or, or rubbing on it uh, on the other side there. Uh, on the opposite side of the crown, it's just worn down perfectly. And to me, that instantly reminded me of a truck that I've got, uh, and right on the window edge uh -huh. yeah, it's where my sweaty arm yeah. when it's hot is sitting and the paint is worn and there's a little bit of grime around the edges uh -huh. and it just goes straight down to the metal Natural and you see all too. the layers of the paint go down. down. Whatever other colors anyone painted it over the years, that's kind of the memory that I saw with that PVD wearing down like that. That's exactly that. I have another one that's pretty similar. So my good luck charm is this Hot Wheels. That's <laughs> literally gone go. around the world. Yeah. That's my rabbit's foot. You keep this with you at all times? Yeah. And Get people that under think, the camera. You know, people think I've had, that, I've had that car, you know, my love affair with Porsche started when I was 10. That story is familiar. <laughs> so people just assume that car is like, I'm 52. They assume it's a 42-year-old car. Well, that car is not even two years old. Wow. It's always in my pocket. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually the Hot Wheels of my car, 277, the car I'm most associated with. But back to that um, Porsche design watch, you know, 1972 was the first year of Porsche design. You know, so that is the first year of that watch. That is a 72. So when it comes to collecting anything, I like to, I'm a goal-oriented collector. So I like to start with the beginning. You know, 911 came out in 64. I had to have a 64 911. I don't own a 2021. Hmm. So to me, it doesn't matter. I always like the beginning of every generation. That 78, 928 I drove down in, that's the first year of the 928. That's the first year of the Porsche design watch. You know, they've gone through various things. You know, that first year doesn't say Orfina on it or, you know, the other ones do. And then it goes to IWC. And, right. you know, now I guess they're making their own movement. We can get into all the... Yeah, everybody's making their yeah. own movement. Yeah. Hey, you guys are making your own movement, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's super impressive. You know, it always sort of throws me when, back to the watch talk, my cousin, my cousin Oliver, he's the same age as me, and uh, he's lived in Switzerland his whole life, and so I don't really see him a ton. But when I first came to America in 1986, we took a Trailways bus from Detroit to L.A. and had a couple of fun-filled weeks in L.A. <laughs> back in 86. You know, it was a great time. But anyway, the point to the story is my cousin lives in Switzerland, and he lives in a little town close to Val Orbe, which is almost on the French border, and it's like a... Nice 20-minute drive from Valley du Joux. So, you know, I've gone over there, and it's kind of strange to be there and see, you know, these big name-brand watch companies sort of in this idyllic setting but in the middle of nowhere. Right. And seeing all these people driving yeah. across the border from France to go 
work at these fancy watch companies in Switzerland. And then my cousins tell me all about how a lot of them don't even make their own movements, you know, or their own case. You know, they might make their own dial and assemble it there, but and it's, it's kind of a strange a, thing. It's an amazing industry over there because, you know, you'll have you'll drive through this tiny little town, like where I was with Automar Piguet in Labrasu, which is nothing. There's a, a little cheese store, and you can look out is of your... Is it cheese your, or uh, fromage over there? Uh, fromagerie, right? Fromagerie, yeah. So there's the, the cheese store. Uh, and basically... Walking down the street, every building is Automar Piguet until you get to this uh, fromagerie. And then there's a whole bunch of little tiny cars coming in with their steel tanks of milk from the day. And you have, if you look into the valley, you see the cows. So all that's coming out of this town is watches and cheese, pretty Same. much. And as you're sitting there making watches in your workshop, looking into the valley, you see the cows. And it's it's like two two completely different industries. Yeah. But that's how it started with watchmaking in the valley. They were the same people. The farmer would farm. They'd raise their animals, and in the winter, they would make watches. When spring came around, <laughs> they would actually send their watches out over the hill into Geneva, and sell them. So they had two industries. But you know, farming during the summer and watchmaking during the winter. It's unbelievable. How did you get sewing? How, how did you get into watches? What is your backstory? I just, I loved watches as a kid. And what I. What did you love about them? The main thing I love about watches is the inside of the watch is this engineering feat, this little mechanical engine that runs and runs. It runs all day, all night, all the time. Until you stop winding it. Until you stop winding it. But now your watch is a manual, right? Uh, yeah, okay. manually wound. But the biggest thing for me was. You have this thing that then goes into a water-resistant case. Hermetically sealed, you can wear it on your wrist. I like everywhere. how you said water-resistant, not waterproof. <laughs> yeah. Well, I get, is, I get very that a tactical big debate, about then? that. All it right. is. People always ask me, waterproof, water-resistant. What is and the difference? So waterproof means that it's not affected by water. So if you have a piece of steel, it is affected by water. It will rust. Leave it out in the rain, it rusts over. Yeah. It's like you're... It's like your brakes, right? Yeah. Your rotors, they rust you know, when it rains. So exactly. And they're not affected by that water. You know, they get rust on the outside, but it's not going to cause them to stop working. Right. A watch, if you get rust on those parts, it will stop working. So it's water resistant when you put it in a watertight case. What is the weak po uh, part of the watch then when it comes to water resistant? The seal? The, yeah. So all of your gaskets, you they'll call age. Them gaskets. Okay. gaskets um, Are they rubber? What you have O-ring. Okay. Um, in your crown, you're going to have an O-ring. You're going to have an O-ring in the case back. And then when you have a crystal pressed in, you're going to have a Teflon gasket. Uh, what does the crystal do? Well, the crystal is so you can see through. Oh, <laughs> oh you mean the crystal face. Oh, right. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the crystals in your watch. Um, but all of those gaskets should be replaced. The main wearing point, though, is going to be in your crown. In the wind you're winding it, yeah. that Movement. gasket. Exactly. It's going to be turning all the time. Uh, and then if you hit it on something while you happen to be underwater, you bend something, that's usually that's where watches spot. leak. That's the Achilles heel. Yeah, it's going to be your crown or pushers on a chronograph, things like that. Those O-rings are so small in there. So how many styles of watches do you guys have? Uh, we make one field watch, okay. and we make a few different versions of that field watch. Okay. Yeah. This one, this is the ultralight which is aluminum movement or aluminium. <laughs> hey, tomato, tomato. <laughs> exactly. And a titanium case. Got it. Uh, and that one's about 30 grams lighter than the standard that I have, which is brass movement. Does the lighter one go case. faster or they both keep the same amount of time? Uh, they both keep the same amount of yeah. time, but I can run a lot faster when okay. I'm in the lightweight one. <laughs> All How right. long have you had the lightweight movement or the lightweight piece? Uh, that's very new. Just uh, We launched that at the uh, the end of 2019, okay. and that's a limited edition of just 100 pieces. And this is all made in the USA? That one, just about. We don't make uh, anything that is sapphire, okay. so your jewels. Uh, we also don't make springs. Okay. Yeah, so that sort of thing. Spring. Exactly. That's going to come from Switzerland. What um, is the coating here on the, on, on the, uh, the black? The black is black anodized. Okay. And, and we that's can do done that. local too? Yeah, that's done local, yeah. What is the difference between PVD coating and anodizing? Oh, that is a so great question. So anodizing is going to be, you could do that on your aluminum. It is much easier. You're putting it into a liquid and it can get everywhere. Okay. Okay. Whereas the 
the PVD or DLC, that's going to be uh, like a line of sight gas. They're almost like putting it in a chamber and misting the coating so it's onto it. almost like a powder coating. Exactly. It's more like a powder coating. Got it. Um, so that one, uh, we've tried doing that on cases here in the U.S., and we have not been successful. We just we end up scrapping too much material. Um, it's now, you a make really your own cases, process. right? Or you have your own cases made locally? Yeah. Uh, I have a workshop that I've been working with in Los Angeles for over five years now, and they've made almost all of our cases. We make some of them here, small runs, um, but they have a, a really great operation, and they've been able to keep all of our tolerances and give us nice finishing and everything. So I like to use their machines to do that. And with our CNC machines, I focus on the, the small, really tight tolerance movement parts. So you're assembling your own, you're making your own movement, everything but the spring, right? Uh, yeah, just about. And you told me there's how many pieces in that, 150? 150 pieces in the watch, about 120 of them are movement. How many hours are involved manually putting movement together? Putting the movement together is pretty quick. It's it's actually the easiest part of the process for me. How as many a hours are involved in putting all those pieces into the movement? We put a movement that we make here, we put it together twice. So the first time is when it's unfinished, just to make sure that everything fits. We set the jewel heights, um, make sure everything's running. How are you running. setting those? You've got spaces? Uh, small small presses with okay. uh, with micrometer stops on them okay. and little tiny uh, uh, pushers and anvils. Do you have good eyesight? I do. Okay. Yeah. Good eyesight. But Are you wearing the loop hearing. or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good Everything's... eyesight, not great hearing. Yeah. Which is good because I could sit at the bench and people can say things and I don't. I don't, I don't even... hear this ticking. Right? <laughs> I'm going to hold like... it up to the mic. You guys can have a sale to an interrogation. I have, I have had people that have asked me, can you make the watch quieter? Yeah. Wow, really? Yeah. But then I have other people who really love a TikTok noise from the watch. Uh, and I guess it's just two different types of brains wired different ways. Some people are going to love the noise of a watch right. and some people it's going to really distract. Why do you, why did you choose to make a manually wound movement as opposed to automatic? Tradition. I like simple. I mean, it, the reason I have this beetle yeah. is because it's, of my watches okay. and this brand, the brand that I've created Weiss watch, uh, the whole idea behind it, was to engineer a watch that could be made in the U.S. So I have it to had admit, to I'm be, super impressed by that, made in USA. It had to be simple, yeah. which manual wind is very important. Uh, automatic mechanisms are more, complicated. more complex, a little more delicate. Some of the parts in them are really hard to manufacture. Uh, so then the case design, I looked at the machine it would be cut on and what we wanted it to look like and brought those two together. And these things are similar to the design of a beetle. Right. The Timeless beetle, classic. exactly. It was designed so that it could be fixed easily. Uh, the assembly line would run really efficiently, and all of the manufacturing could be done at a very low cost so that it could be done in the way that it was done, and you could have a product that was attainable at the end so they could actually get a car out to everyone. So that's kind of in line with what I'm trying to do with Weiss watches. How many watch brands exist today where that are in a similar position to you, made in USA? Not very simple. Few. What, two Titan. or three, maybe? Made yeah, I know a couple other watchmakers that make movements in the US, and it's it's a really small industry. They're you know they're producing a, far fewer watches. It's uh, I mean, there's not a whole lot of people who are out there looking for it to begin with. Bit of a niche market. Exactly. It didn't used to be. You you mentioned Hamilton yeah, earlier, US. American yeah, company, right. Hamilton Elgin. I mean, the United States used to be a cradle almost for yeah. watchmaking. I mean, we were manufacturing millions and millions of really high quality watches. But and what happened? Well, that is a good question, and that's kind of up for debate. I mean, there there are the issues with like production, and then there you could have been like labor disputes and things of that sort. Then there was just demand. I mean, the Swiss really came out there. I, I think a lot of people misunderstand exactly how the Swiss industry really came to be the way that it came to be. Um, the Swiss industry was kind of, I, I don't want to compare it to China, and I'm not going to because I'm going to get blasted, but basically the Swiss just had a system, and they were able to manufacture Sounds watches efficiently Swiss. and um, cost-effectively, we'll say, that there's a reason why Hans Wildorf went to Switzerland to manufacture watches in Switzerland as opposed to manufacturing watches in the UK because it was British. You know, so... 
I, you can you can continue on that, but basically, from what I understand, yeah. the way that history kind of unfolded itself, uh, things just became very expensive, and the demand for watches from the United States just dwindled, and that's why the majority of watches came from either Switzerland and later down the line when the Swiss um, had their own crisis with quartz. That's when the Japanese really kind of took over. I mean, but you've had these industries. You've had pockets. I mean, even the Soviets, after they took over you know, the, the, the German watch brands, really, the, the Eastern uh, you know, watch brands, we'll call them, uh, they had a, a thriving watchmaking industry, but they kind of didn't really export any of them out. Now they kind of do, but obviously it's not Soviets. It's yeah. just you what know, the Russians. What is the world's oldest known surviving watch? Oh, that is a great question. Oldest you know, it starts with watch. a sundial, right? We're telling time with a sundial, and yeah, probably pretty much. I, yeah. We yeah. never got into this, but uh, a, a naman is basically a stick in the ground, okay. and you need the sun right. to shine light on that stick, and that, that's that's one of the oldest timekeeping devices. But something that someone physically put on their wrist. Physically put on their wrist. Um, well, if you go and you think about, I know before watches. the wrist watch, there was a pocket watch on a yeah, chain. Yeah, so right? wrist watches. Relatively recent. You're talking within the last hundred years. Um, then you get into pocket watches. Pocket watches that are mechanically right. similar to what we make in wrist watches now, but just a larger scale. You're about 200 years. Then you start getting into different types of mechanisms where the, the escapement was different. You got chains you know, and weights, move yeah, pendulums swinging. Exactly. Totally right. different stuff when you're dealing with. Uh, early 1800s and 1700s, okay. even 1600s. Yeah, marine navigation. The only yeah. reason that, well, not not the only reason, but one of the many reasons why people were able to get to where they were going in the ocean, this vast, vast ocean, was timekeeping. Right. Yeah, chronometers. That's where chronometry came from. Now, that leads me to the question, there's no chronograph in the Weiss watch line, right? No, no chronograph. What's the story there? Not interested <laughs> or? So, uh, like you were saying about... Uh, a lot of companies not making the whole watch. Well, a chronograph is a perfect example of that. Uh, I worked for Audemars Piguet. They did not make a chronograph movement until very recently. They just released it last year. Prior to that, any chronograph that up. was like a one-off, basically. Lamania 5100. Yeah, so that's a, a Lamania movement in there. Right. So there was very few companies that could they mastered the chronograph they could make it efficiently and reliably so they had a, a a good way to do it and all these other companies just buy from them so that movement lamania what is it 51 5100 i think how, how many I'm other watch sure. companies use that movement hundreds oh, hundreds yeah yeah you'll find that movement in hundreds of other brands so that's a pretty common movement very common right so there's very few uh, chronograph movements that exist out there. Just a lot of different watch Pick designs that, that they I went through. In. I just brought a few of... They're all kind of the same but different. Yep. It kind of reflects... This is probably 7750, right? Valjou? Valjou. Looks like the... Yeah. Yep. So that would be in a Hoya. It would be in a lot of different watches. Yeah. A lot of modern watches still use uh, Valjou 7750s. Where it's are those workers. movements made? Uh, they're all Swiss. All Swiss. Yeah. Yeah. So like I was saying, Audemars Piguet just started producing their own chronograph. And they're one of the oldest operating uh, family-owned Swiss watchmakers. Uh, so for them to just create this is amazing. Was there a demand there for them or they just felt it's, ti it's time? You know, I was talking about timings and everything. Was it time for that watch company to make their own movement? I think right now people seem to be interested in watch companies making their own movements. It's just kind of sort of the farm-to-table trend. Exactly. You know, it's bit, like where did yeah. kale come from, right? So it's been around, and then <laughs> right? five years ago, all of a sudden, there's a kale explosion. Yeah, and, and I think that's a, that has a lot to do with it. Um, what, kale? But also, yeah, <laughs> kale, definitely. Kale is involved for sure. How's kale um, production in Switzerland? That <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How's kale production? But if you, if you think about how watches have really gained a lot of popularity in the years... There seems um, to be a lot of startup boutique watch companies, and I know this firsthand because a lot of them are, have approached me. Let's do a you know let's do a watch collaboration together. Yeah, you know, there's a lot. I've probably had half a dozen watch companies approach me to. Well, the do problem a with those is, and they're all little boutique companies, right? I've well, they they, I think they're formed as far as let's say like they're the way that they're incorporated is kind of boutique looking, but a lot of 
those companies are not really watch manufacturers. What they do is they essentially just buy watches right. from overseas, right. like from China. I mean, you can go and have Alibaba. someone print a dial with a logo on it and put exactly. it together, right? Yeah, right. Okay. I mean, like I'm not going to name joke. names, but you there are there are now retail locations for some of these brands. I've I've saw one in a mall where you walk by and you have you know basically watches that are two to three dollars a pop on Alibaba and they just have the label or you know the brand and, and the logo on there and is they're this, selling them for like 150 bucks is this sort of like <laughs> you know the infamous New York Canal Street fake Rolex 25 dollar story here I wouldn't be surprised if the same people <laughs> yeah. make those watches I mean, yeah what do you know about you know uh Porsche design making their own movement now um I don't know a whole lot about okay. it actually have you heard about that or I have okay yeah so, it's not like breaking news right here, right now. This is out there in the watch world. Right. Well, yeah. within I think the last 15 years, maybe 15, I don't think 20, about 15 years or so, watch manufacturers have really started pushing on the manufacturing of the own movement. Because I think a lot of people, when they discovered that like watches that were five, ten, yeah, between five and ten thousand dollars, I mean, Just in some cases money. like fifty, sixty, a hundred thousand, like Patek Philippe uses Lamania movements right. and and other movements as well. So when people started discovering that and you're paying a lot of money for right. something kind of generic on the inside, you want something else. And I think the Swiss watch industry kind of realized that, and they started pushing the whole... It's amazing well, we how they got movement. away with that for so long, right? Well, well I, I, watch I think of it in branding, a different I way. You know, it's not a bad from, thing, by the way. Coming from it's the, not a bad the thing manufacturing all. side of it, though, and right. actually making watches, I see it more as the demand for watches has increased so greatly in a, a very short period of time that... Uh, you actually are maxing out these production lines okay. that existed. All right. So the people that were making that Lamania uh, caliber and stamping those parts, machining those parts, they're maxed out. They can't make any more. If, if they want to they're make more, they're going to have to retool, uh, change the way they're doing it. And that brand, it's now owned by the Swatch Group. So sure. they don't really care to retool to supply everyone else. They'd rather just supply their own brand. Um, so there's not the availability of, of these movements. movements. So if I had a really cool design for a chronograph, right now, I can't necessarily go out and just buy a chronograph movement from someone to complete Did my design. Did you design your own movement? I mean, I'm assuming you're not reinventing the wheel here, right? No, it's all old technology. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, nothing's changed there, right? Exactly. It's uh, a bunch of gears and cogs and springs that move. and. Yep, pinions, yeah. springs, jewels, bridges, plates. How did you design your movement then? So I started with a Swiss movement that we had been using for, uh, at that point, like four years, and basically reverse engineered it to start. Totally reverse engineered, made that movement. Then, How long ago was that when you made your own movement? It was about three years ago. Okay. Yeah. So that was the, the first one we got ticking, and that was an unbelievable day for me. How did that feel? <laughs> that felt amazing. That was the, the best What time thing. of the day was that when you got uh, that first was, movement ticking? It was Middle of the weekend, like midday, sunny outside. I was sitting over here. It was a little so different done organization. Right here in yeah, right here in this space. A moment in time, a moment in history yeah. right here. And I remember sitting at the workbench, looking out the window, just thinking like, this has to start ticking. Why? What is not working? And finally, I got it, I got it working. Uh, there were a few little, you know, we're filing down material and changing things when, it, when we're prototyping. So getting it to work and then sitting there and watching it tick for the first time. And it kept ticking. And it kept ticking. Who it was, was the first person amazing. you called and screamed at? Uh, I called my dad. Oh. Yeah, immediately. What did he say? Proud he was moment? very excited. Yeah. I took a video. I have a video on my phone of it. It was great. But uh, we did that. And then from there, I made updates that I wanted. Uh, things that as a watchmaker, I said, this is stupid. I don't like this. <laughs> we don't need this. We want this. And made these updates. Um, but essentially, you have ratios that all of these amazing uh, watchmakers have come up with before us. These guys were scientists. They were... You're not a scientist. I'm not a scientist. I make watches. You know, I can mach I'm a machinist. I can make things, but I'm not on the level that these guys were. These guys were inventing the palette for Inventing time. Inv yeah, they were inventing these things. So, you know, as a watchmaker, you have to be very humble because you're not really doing that much. You're just making what somebody else created. You're not reinventing the wheel. You're just kind of keeping it alive. We don't really reinvent the wheel. Um, so, you know, back to making some changes and, and just being able to actually make my own watch as a watchmaker, that was my initial goal. And I, I got to it relatively quick. You know, I'm, 
I'm only 33 years old right now. You got so. a whole lot of time left. Yeah. What is the next goal? The what next, next goal? Year? Yeah. I'd like to make a lot more of those movements. Okay. Yeah. With the popularity of watches, there's a there's a shortage in the do movement th- do department. Do you think most people own more than one watch? That's a good question. It depends think, on what you talk. What do you mean by most people? Most watch collectors, or more, most people that like, know like, of watches, or does the average person own a watch, or are they just looking at time on the phone, or they've got a smart an Apple? I, I don't have an Apple watch. I suppose my question is: obviously, watch collectors own more than one watch because you can't have a collection of one. Sure. I don't think. But does the average person own a watch, or do they own several? Watches? I think they do, and. They got a large part time of that, or something. A large part of that has to do with Apple, you know. And I, I thank them for producing the Apple Watch, yeah. because there are a lot of people who now wear a watch who did that not wear, wear a watch. Before. So you think someone bought an Apple Watch and then said, "Oh, I really like this. It feels good. It's a piece of jewelry. It's functional. I'm now going to get a mechanical watch." Maybe not a mechanical watch, but from there, it a wouldn't wristwatch. surprise me if they thought, you know, this doesn't look the way I want it to look got when it. I go out you know, to a concert or I'm going out on a date or I'm going into a um, a meeting where I want to impress someone instead of say oh, This is a topic to we can talk about that, now. You know, oh, I have this on my wrist because I'm more important than you. So, you know. What are, all right, great point. What are the top five watches that impress if you're in that meeting in the boardroom with your monogrammed cuff colored Ooh. shirt? And- uh, I think I have an answer for this. Rolex, yeah. Rolex, 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 and Rolex. Why no, did- I, I would I would say uh Patek Philippe. Well, I would think be a- Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna disagree with you on that, but I think like what the most a, universal a watch. Tank or something? Reversal. Uh, I don't you know, they're recognizable, yeah. but I think the kind of person if you had the right person and you had the right vintage of that watch yeah. it could be uh it could be good but i think uh what i think there are other brands Patek? uh patek philippe yeah patek patek you're saying rolex 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 well i think it depends on who you're going to see yeah, yeah. right i think it really depends on that kind of factor let's say if you're going to to look uh for an for, for an investor and you're sitting down with i don't know a vc or something like that they will probably look at your wrist and you don't maybe think it- you don't think an eighties Casio calculator watch is going to go? Wow, this is retro cool. This guy's really on it. Remember depends on if you're, depends, if you're like a software yeah. engineer, maybe, yeah, right? uh, maybe something like that. I mean, it's. I think here's here's the thing with um, watches are very individual. Exactly, right? yeah. I was just it's about like to say that. My buddy Phil, Mister Enthusiast, you know him? Uh, no. Phil Toledero, New York guy, car guy. Mister Enthusiast. That sounds maybe fun. Hold on, I got to pull this up on the ground while we talk. So my buddy Phil. Pull up Instagram. Can you get that on the I screen? wish I could, but our oh, technical dif- oh. difficulties have been barred. <laughs> so here's I mean, my buddy from Phil, Mr. That. Enthusiast. So basically, I'm going to show you what he did because the picture's worth a thousand words. You know what I'll do is actually after the fact, Magnus, if you could just let me know after, I'll, I'll listen to the show and then I'll plug stuff so in. So I'll do the editing Phil, on that. He's a, he's a design nerd. He's a car guy. He's a Group B rally car guy. Lancia Delta, Integrale, Peugeot 205, Lancia Stratos. That's good stuff. Renault 5 Turbo, that's kind of his jam baby. So he's a watch guy. He's into all these obscure things from the 30s, 40s, 50s. He's also got this wacky taste in 70s and 80s stuff. And then this is what he did to a Rolex. Check that out. I've seen that picture. (laughs) I think it was on your Instagram, no? Probably. Okay. So he took a Rolex, did his own dial, sandblasted the case. You know, I can't quite, it's awesome. I can't quite figure out if it's a fuck you to all the Rolex guys or <laughs> it's just a really cool art piece, you yeah, know, which, which leads to all these other watch companies, right? You know, like, yeah. you know, all these people just blacking stuff out. So if you look at, I'm going to plug my buddy Phil, Mr. Enthusiast here. You know, this is what he's into with watches, but everyone's got a personal taste, right? Of course. Watches, and I think it's a sort of ref- a reflection on their individual style, design aesthetic or whatever it may be, right? But why is it that the Rolex is always the status symbol, right? It's like, you, you know, you watch Entourage and Ari Gold's running out to get someone a Rolex, but just get him a stainless one, you know, just get the base model, stainless, right. whatever, right? Yeah. But I don't quite get it's it. It's branding. It's just it's just this consistent brand. Look at Porsche, for example, right? When you are successful and you want a really nice car, you, for the most part, are going to go for a Porsche, right? It's Or maybe like a Mercedes or something like that. But there's really no, like, when Porsche says there is no substitute, there really isn't a substitute. He's good on the think about it, right? So, 
you've got something that is so ingrained, right? You've got something that's so stable. That brand is so stable. Like when I was in business school, we were taking a look at logos and we were taking, taking a look at branding. And consistently, the, the brands that were at the top were brands like Mercedes, Porsche, Apple, Rolex. You know, mm-hmm. you, that, that was the only watch brand that was at the top of that whole, like, recognizable the Rolex thing. Daytona 24-hour, right? Exactly, right. right. I see that. Yeah, and That's the individualism movie. of it all is, is, it's all fun and great, but, you know, I think once you have that solid, solid branding, you can take that individualism and then it kind of makes sense because if you individualize something that no one really knows, right. well, it's kind of a thing that you did yourself. Oh, okay, great, congratulations. But if you do something like that, like your friend to that Rolex, yeah, that's yeah. one thing, or doing what you did to Porsche. You know, and what other people are doing now to Porsche, like, uh, you know, like Singer, the yeah. whole reimagine thing, like Gunther Works and, and things of that sort. When you take a brand that is such a strong brand, it's a lot, I think it's a lot easier to do it, but who knows? Now, a lot of people have messed around with Rolexes, right? You know, powder coated right. the case, PVD'd it, made it black, did a different dial. Yeah. They're even skeletonizing them now. Well, I mean, you get to a point where it feels like everyone has a Rolex. And right. Yeah, if, you and Like you said, you didn't want that. Right. You know, you want something different. So uh, there was a a group that they want something different. And it's also like, I can buy this status symbol and I can just completely change it because I'm not about that. I, you know, customization. Yeah. Right. Right. Or you can go the route of say something like this, where you can buy a traditional date chest that's 36 millimeters, but this isn't a date chest. This is just a date. And I was having, like, I was at a wedding in uh, Cabo. And there was a guy there who is, I mean, he's, he's getting into watches, is kind of becoming a watch collector. And Is we, that a common thing for guys to get into watches and become a watch collector at a certain point in their life? Yeah, I think so, but I think, I, get, I think it depends. It really depends on where you come from and what your priorities are. I see some of these things out there, you know, I'm always messing around on the phone and, you know, these, these guys have got the whatever it is watch with a cigar next to it, and it's all curated, and it's, sure. you know, shot sort of semi-out of focus, and there's a cigar smoke in the background <laughs> wafting through, and maybe there's a glass of some sort of bourbon or whiskey, and it's there's a, a lot of over... Every, I guess there's a slice for everybody in this watch pie, right? I talk about it with Porsche all the time. You know, it's a big, big piece of the pie. Some people like to go to golf courses and have Concord judges judge their car and tell sure. them what's wrong with it with white gloves and Q-tips, and then people like to customize uh, uh, cars or race or drive or whatever it is. The watch world kind of seems the same way. Yeah, it's it's very similar. I, You know, like you were saying, people collect all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's about collecting. People love collecting. And, you know, I, I like cars. I like watches. I, I rarely meet any person that I introduce myself as a watchmaker, and they say, oh, I don't, I don't like watches. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Almost everyone says, oh, I love watches, even if they don't have watches. Right. The Something exception of my future it, wife, she is, she is not a watch person. She is not a watch person. She's not a jewelry person <laughs> okay. at all. She doesn't like to wear bracelets. She doesn't like to wear necklaces. See, I'm not a jewelry person either. No bracelet, no ring, no, no nothing, but I like watches. But it's interesting. Yeah. Recently, I was chasing something. You know, I wanted, okay, Omega, I got the Speedmaster, Flightmaster. I love the way they look. I looked at one in Switzerland, actually, in a small watch shop in Yverdon, not far from Lausanne, and I just like the way they look until I tried one on, and then I realized, wow, this thing's really big. Yeah. seems kind of clunky. The Probably, colors on that are great. Yeah, I, I was attract. Everything attracted me about the watch until I put it on. Yeah, and then I was like, I'm never going to wear this. Hmm. And so that was it. Game over with that one. Well, think about it when you get into a car. And you drive it for two, three miles. You're you know, going to make a decision. Away. Yeah, straight right? away. You're either going to drive it or yeah. you're not going to drive it. Right. Like my car was recently totaled thanks to a gentleman who was driving a, a very. No, I actually parked my car in the street. Oh, and this guy T boned my car to the extent where it is. I mean, I'm fighting the insurance company right now, as you know, I'm sure you guys know. What car was it? It's a, it's a Honda Civic SI. Okay. Which is one of my favorite cars. I mean, I was looking at cars in kind, in kind of, you know, different brackets. I mean, cars worth double the money of that car. In fact, I actually had to go back to the dealership because I need a car now. So I was going and test driving cars. Driving everything from, like, Cadillacs, you know, the new CT, uh, CT6 and uh, Alfa Romeo Giulias and, and cars that are double the price of that Civic. And every single car I drove, I got even more depressed that my yeah. car was destroyed because 
I love I've I've been a lifelong lifelong Honda guy. So to, to me that car is like that's that's what I want. Right. That's what makes me happy. That's what it drives the way that it. I like it to drive. Got it. Right? And I think the, the when it, when you what you're describing is a similar experience just with a different thing. It's a different it. object. I recently bought a car that I didn't even drive. I I bought a lot of cars sight unseen, not driven like you know the turbo in Australia. Obviously I didn't fly to Australia and drive the turbo. I just I've owned a lot of them and you know I have this motto, expect the worst, hope for the best. And I'm never disappointed that way. You yeah. know, I, I hardly ever do a PPI. I recently did it on one car that I recently acquired, but um, I hardly ever do it. But the point to the story I'm trying to talk about, I recently bought a GT2. My buddy was selling it, lifelong LA car. I never actually drove the car. I went down there. He took me for a drive. He's a good driver. I go, just step on it. It's all I need to feel. I know it's going to do everything, but I want to feel this boost. I really want to feel it. The seat of the pants feel. Right. He stepped on it. I go, okay, that's all I need to know. I actually never drove the car before I bought it. And then I went out of town, long story short. You know, a month had passed. I came back, and first time I ever drove the car was when I drove it away from his facility. And that was the first time I'd ever done that, actually buy a car that I was in but didn't physically drive. But what I needed to get out of that test drive, his right foot told me all I needed to, to know, and I felt it through my butt cheek sat in the passenger seat. And, Mm -hmm. that's the story right the there but dino the very famous but dino yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah okay well let's uh i got some questions for you okay. in terms of aesthetic i mean you you created a, an empire for yourself through i don't fashion. know about empire but i think it's a empire. building downtown sure uh building downtown that holds an empire how about that <laughs> holds a few cars <laughs> okay <laughs> moving forward fair enough right so you know, you're so much on us uh, on aesthetics. In Urban Outlaw, you actually talked about the iconic shape of the Porsche. So with with these watches, I mean, you, you've, you've discussed a couple of different watches that have iconic shapes. For example, like Rolex. Rolex watches have iconic shapes. Uh, most of the time, in the wild, why do they get stolen so much? Well, because people know it's a Rolex. Because, you know, it's, it's either a Datejust or a Submariner or a Daytona, right? So if we could pop some more of those watches out, let's talk about... The style well, and the shapes I, as to I've why you picked them. I've got a theme here, you know. I just line them up. You know, they're all same but different. Right. Uh, I noticed chronograph, black. <laughs> um, they're pretty much all the same. Chronograph, black. Right. Well, that one's not a black chronograph, but. Oh, yeah. there you go. Nice. Yeah. So, what drew you to this particular watch? I always wanted a Hoyer, not a Tag Hoyer. You know, it's an iconic era, right? It dates back to this iconic era and a moment in time. You know, when I think of Hoy, you think of motorsports, racing, Le Mans, late 60s, early 70s. You know, obviously you can't talk about Hoyer and not talk about McQueen, but the Monaco or the Monaco, whatever you want to call it. I don't like that watch. <laughs> you know, to me, that doesn't look good. You know, I've never owned one. I've never wanted one, but I wanted a Hoyer. Yeah. And I wanted a, a, a Tavia to begin with, and I saw that and – I just like the look of it, and it was affordable. Yet again, I don't want to spend a lot of money on things that I don't necessarily know I'm going to wear. You know what I mean? It's like the smiles per mile or the enjoyment out of it. But there's obviously a theme here, right? You know, the old chronographs, and they're all essentially look the same. And it's what I joke about with my Porsches. I own a lot of them. And I joke, we spoke about earlier on, it's a Beetle. They're all Beetles, right? Right. But I like the stones. But, you know, it's, it's a joke. But I own a lot of 911s that all sort of look the same at a glance, but all do slightly different things. These watches, are they all look the same, and they all do the same thing. They all tell time, but they probably tell it in a slightly different way. Yeah. You know, it just, even though I've got these and a few others, I always go back to the 72 beat-up Porsche design watch. You know, recently I sort of started wearing the Speedmaster again a little bit, and those two just feel right. Truth be told, everything else I brought on the table I like, but I've never fully connected to. Yeah, really? You know, I don't really wear, you know, before I got the 72 um, Porsche design one, I had kind of a little Frankenstein one that was pieced together. And then, you know, whenever I see them, I, I just sort of, I'm drawn to them. And for some reason, I pick them up and I kind of have to have them, even though I don't necessarily wear them. So maybe that says something about me collecting things. But I don't like to throw anything away. Yeah. Recently, I bought a painting. I've got this Ted Pym painting. It's this. It's, it looks like something that was painted 200 years ago. It's a fresh modern take on Samson and Delilah, but it looks like it could have hung in any Gothic church. So long story short, it's like a big piece. It's five by nine. I hang it on the wall, and this prompted me to remodel my loft downtown. 
I'm cleansing, I'm spring cleaning. So the moral to the story is I had hundreds of Porsche magazines that were all on these shelves that most people would have probably just thrown them away. But I've got a big warehouse around the corner, so I had to box them up and go move them to another shelf in the other warehouse. But I hadn't looked at them in probably 10 years. I don't read. I look at, I look at pictures. I guess I don't have patience to read. I just like <laughs> looking at pictures. But I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't throw anything away. It's the same with cars, you know, I just... I'm not a hoarder, I'm a collector, but if I'm not driving them, I like to look at them. The watches is just one of those things that I have my couple of favorites, but somehow I don't need another one that looks the same, but somehow I end up acquiring it. But they all have interesting stories. Like I bought one in Paris recently. You know, I love flea market shopping. I walk into this watch store. Turns out these people know me, a bunch of young kids starting up a watch company in Paris. They've got some cool stuff. I got to look at it in the case. They strike me a deal that's just too good to pass up. It's a couple of hundred euros. I go, okay, yeah, I'll take it. Do I need it? No. But do I want it? Yes. So yeah. there you have it. Does I think it give you a comfort. certain level of comfort? Or like, I'm trying to kind of understand the psychology behind this because I'm a minimalist. I so can't, I can't do that. you have an with nothing in it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, you could pretty much say that. Yeah, I guess I'm not a minimalist. You know, part of it is instant gratification in that moment. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. At least with watches, maybe. With the Porsches, I'm a goal-orientated collector. Okay. So if we want to sidestep and talk Porsche for a minute, my goal there is whatever everything Porsche's ever made in a sports car. So it's front-engine, mid-engine, rear-engine, air and water-cooled. You know, this is a big thing in the Porsche world. Is it air-cooled or water-cooled? Ironically, if you go on my Instagram today, let's do this. I've got an interesting little post going on in between air and water-cooled. So ironically, you know, it's a photo of the new 2020 Porsche Turbo, which is superimposed, mm -hmm. CGI'd in my space in downtown with my early 76 Turbo next to it. Right. And the question is, air or water-cooled? You know, in the Porsche world, it's like, oh, is it air-cooled or water-cooled? For me, back to the point I'm making, goal-orientated collector, it's one of everything. If there's a Porsche label on it, it doesn't matter to me whether it's on a 924, 928, 944, 968, 914, 356. If it's a sports car and it says Porsche on it, I'm all about it. No two ever drive the same, but it's all about variety and experiencing different way of going from A to B. Gotcha. So you just want the experience. That's that's what's important it's an to experience you. experience to me. Got it. Like okay. today, I, I came in the 928, right? It's right. 1978. It's the first year of the 928. You don't really see them on the road. The drive is good. It's a talky V8. It's got Pasha interior. It's the closest thing I can do to stepping back in time hmm. to 1978. You know, it's, we can't go back to the future, right? You know, like, like the film. Right. But I can go get in, you know, if I want to see what 19... 65 feels like, smells like, drives like, I have a 1965 911. Right. And that is time travel to me. You know, we're on this theme of time, right? Watch and listen, the name of the yeah. podcast. I'm always all about time. Right. There's a time for everything. Time to buy a guitar, time not. But I'm like that with uh, with my pickup truck. It's a 62. And every time I do maintenance on it, I think, you know, my grandfather did this to his car, not because it was fun. Not because he enjoyed, he had you know, uh, setting the points or anything. He, he didn't enjoy this. It was just what you did. Survival. You know, it was that was how you got from A to B. And you didn't have AC. You didn't have power brakes. You didn't have power steering. You didn't have, you know, ahead. electronic ignition. You had to be prepared More engaged. to do these things. And yeah. it was a different experience. Right. I think now, you know, everything's accelerating so quick. We're at this point, you know, the automobile's been around 125 years up to this point, right, as an internal combustion engine. And all of a sudden, in the next 10 years, that's going to get phased out? Sure. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. You know, I think <laughs> as long as you can still get oil and gasoline, I tell this story all the time. Jay Leno's the perfect example. Jay Leno's the greatest car collector I know, and his knowledge is phenomenal, but his openness and his genuineness and his approachability is what makes him a really special guy. And one of my most memorable moments of any car drive is the first time I went on the Jay Leno Garage show. He said, have you ever been in a steam car? Mm -hmm. Well, who's been in a steam car, right? It's very much about a steam car. Yeah, Stanley no steam one. Cars, yeah. That's what I took a drive in, the Stanley steam car. So Jay's got, I don't know, he's got half a dozen of them. Yeah. So you don't just turn the key and go. The Stanley steam car story is great. I'll take a minute and tell it to you. You know, you got to fire up the boiler, wait for it to come up to boil and pressure. This takes 10, 15 minutes. So he push, he's got to push the car out. He's got a bunch of guys. They roll it out. It's not a car. They roll the steam engine out, stoke the boiler, fire it up, 
15 minutes later, there's water everywhere. <laughs> this one had sprung a leak. No biggie, Jay's got a few more, right? So by this time, by the time we're actually sat in the steam car, it's at least half an hour right. has passed, so we're not instantly going anywhere. But we drove around basically Burbank Airport for half an hour. It was, you know, there was three of us in the car, and it was just such a memorable experience. Yeah. So I always use that as a reference point to, I don't think these billions of cars that are on the road that are internal combustion motors are going to disappear overnight, right? Because there's a new car, Taycan in town that's a plug-in electric. And I look at it like the watch industry because I think it's very similar. We had the quartz crisis in the watch industry. I was just about to say that, absolutely. Okay, but I am here, and I started a watch company in 2013 to make mechanical watches. We're not making anything quartz. We're not making anything electronic or battery-powered. That's not what we want to do. The same thing is going to happen in the car industry, I think. I think so You're too. going to have electric cars, which are going to be reliable. They're going to be... Uh, safe and good for the environment these and all of these the things. Cars. Exactly. Like, That's right. going to be your car. And then there's going to be the experience. Right. The thing you can really connect to. I don't know how many people are connecting to their Priuses or their Teslas, um, but I connect with my cars. Got it. Just yeah. like I connect with mechanical watches. I'm the same. Um, you know, a, a quartz watch is a watch and they're very interesting. I own quartz watches. I see you have a quartz watch in your collection as well. You know, there's a place for that. But for mechanical watches, they're not going anywhere. They will still be produced. People will still push into that realm, just like with gas-powered cars. I don't drive a lot of miles, but probably 90% of my driving is pure pleasure. So the other day, a guy comes to see me, leaves Santa Monica, drives 18 miles to downtown. He left Santa Monica at 4 p.m. What time do you think he got downtown? <laughs> Six? Six, yeah. <laughs> 5.45. Yeah, it took yeah. an hour and 45 minutes just to go 18 miles. Yeah. yeah. So that's not pleasurable driving. That's a ball lake commute, right? Mm -hmm. Pleasurable driving in that same hour and 45 minutes, I could have gone up to Newcomb's Ranch and back, and that's a round trip of about 92 miles. Yeah. And that was super memorable. Right. And I didn't sit behind anybody. So to me... It's horses for courses, right? You know, these, everything you just described moving forward technology-wise is autonomous driving is great if you're going to spend an hour and 45 minutes doing that drive from Santa Monica to downtown and back, add up the amount of hours you're wasting there, right? Right. So yeah, if that car can drive itself and you can be working whilst being commuted or driven or chauffeured or whatever you want to call it, that's great. But that's not enjoyment Cannot replace driving. that drive no. that, that you're doing. You know, doing, the yeah. crest will still be there. And like I keep going back to, as long as you still get oil and uh, gasoline, People are still going to be tinkering and driving these, you know, internal combustion analog cars. They're not going to disappear like the dinosaurs yeah. did, at least well, in the next hundred years. You know, we, we always, as human beings, we always want something to connect to. We always want someone to connect to and something to connect to, right? right? And when you're talking about, let's say, like, not not all of them, but, you know, there, there are some exceptions. But when you're majorly, majorly, t the majority of your conversation is, let's say, uh, quartz, you're probably not going to be super enthused about it. And one of the main reasons about quartz, and I'm talking about from a collective You're not standpoint. talking about that cluster of black quartz crystal I got on my No, no table. not that yet. <laughs> uh, although you are getting into crystals, so yeah, we can't have a conversation about that. Crystal. But what I'm trying to say is this. You know, when you're looking at, let's say, like a Casio watch, and yeah, there's some kind of, you know, there's that retro feel to it, but that's really the only connection that you have to it because it's such a disposable item. And most things it's right now... It's disposability. Exactly, yeah. You know, all of these items right now that you were being kind of thrusted upon uh, are disposable this is Phones. kind of a perfect example exactly right, right. Yeah. yeah this right here that i said i live my life around is disposable it is yeah the, the minute the next model comes out it's going to have something faster something better you're going to have a better camera which is going to allow you to take better pictures so you're going to want that next best thing but you're not connected like i hate my phone i don't want to be around my phone because i feel like i spend too much time on it but when i'm picking something up that doesn't do anything but tell time you, you have this connection to it. Like, you feel kind of naked without it. You, you go to the pool. Like, when I was in Cabo, I was going to the pool. And, I, yeah, I should probably not wear a watch like this in Mexico, although I was in a pretty safe, you know, hotel. But I didn't want to take it off. I wanted to take that risk, partially because it's insured. But, you know, you, you don't have that connection to a Tesla because the second the firmware is updated, it's a different car. It might be faster. But it's still a different car. You don't really get that time to connect to it. 
And in the courts crisis, I think that's what happened is you couldn't really connect to these things because what happens when the courts watch stops? Well, you either replace the battery or you put in a brand new movement. There's no fixing. Or you just throw it away and you get a new watch. Or you throw it away, right, like the Swatch stuff, you know, so which is kind of interesting that the new Swatch System 51s and, and like, the newer uh, mechanical uh, Swatch stuff is is collectible. So it's it's not always the case, but the majority of the cases. How long has the Swatch company been around? Very long time. Yeah, they so they came to be during the quartz crisis. Yeah. Uh, that was how S- Switzerland stayed when involved. When was the quartz crisis? Uh, uh, we're talking 70s okay. would be... Because I remember Swatch coming on the scene. must have been late 70s. Yeah. I was probably 10. But I remember early 80s, like, you know, it was cool to have a Swatch. It was very cool. Yeah. That was kind of a cool, affordable thing, right? Yeah. Right, but Not it's also that, cool to have were, an uh, iPhone versus, like, let's say, you know, you've got these clicks. You've got it's cooler to have an iPhone versus a Droid or or yeah. something like that, right? Yeah. Or Droid is that even a term anymore? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, you talk about phones. Yeah, I was never the guy that I didn't get an iPhone until <clears throat> iPhone five, and I've had four iPhones since the yeah, five, I, the six. I just got iPhone. I just went seven. iPhone finally. So I went from <laughs> seven to eleven. <clears throat> Before that, I had the Motorola flip phone. You know, I never did the BlackBerry or whatever was cool 10, 15 years ago. I never texted. I used to make fun of people like this. <laughs> Always texting. Now it's kind of a different yeah. story. I, yeah. I'm envious of um, some of these CEOs of businesses that I look up to, uh, you know, being a business owner myself. A lot of them are from a generation where they never had to actually do email. Right. And they don't have a cell phone. You know, it's, you reach me at the office between these hours. <laughs> yeah. Right. And if, yeah. you, if you try and <laughs> electronically communicate with me, you're not going to get a response. If right. you need a response, the proper thing is to call me or reach my secretary and, and we will speak. Though. That does seem And it seems a little antiquated, but it also seems like it could be very efficient. Right now, I find that I waste a lot of time responding to things on uh, in different channels on the internet. Got it. Communicating. And, uh, exactly. Well, Spend a lot be, of time communicating. You've got to be selective to what is a priority to communicate. Yeah. My pet peeve is the opposite of that. Send someone an email, they don't get back to you, you run into them, oh, I saw your email, I'm so sorry I didn't get back to you, I was <laughs> traveling. I go, well, this thing works, my phone, I don't know about yours, but this works anywhere in the world. Exactly. <laughs> so there's no excuse anymore of, I'm sorry I've been traveling. If you saw my email, this is to anyone out there listening that sees my email and <laughs> doesn't respond and then tells me we're traveling is an excuse. That no longer works for me. All right. That's I, my point. I have uh, good Communication point. is key. You know, whether it's yes or no, just tell me one way or the other. Yes or no, I can do it. No, I can't, right? Yeah. That's a personal thing for me. It's like punctuality. Punctuality is something that never goes out of style, right? Mm-hmm. Timing on that is... This, that's how I judge someone, really. Are they punctual or not? That's the first thing. It's well, very there's valuable. A, there's I a mean, mutual it, respect. It's the Go first ahead. key word, yeah. mutual respect. Right if you're not there. punctual, you don't value somebody else's time, time as much right? as you value your own time. I mean, it's, we're it's on a theme of time selfish. here, right? Yeah. You know, with technology, you could be even more punctual because you could literally take your phone and be you could type in wherever it is that you're going, and you could see what time you're going to arrive, even if you're looking like right. three hours in advance. Yeah. Two days ago, this happened to me. Doing a photo shoot with someone Friday, so whatever that is, three days ago. Guy's got a photo shoot schedule. I think it's at nine. I wake up. I, I want to go drive this, you know, GT2. It's new car fever. I go, oh, I should have got up a bit earlier. I know it's going to take me two hours to go to Newcombs and back approximately with traffic, blah, blah, blah. But I go, fuck it. Make the most of every moment. I'm going anyway. I'll make sure I'm back. So you get up there. There's no phone connection. You know, I turn the phone off because no point. No signal up there in the mountains. And I, you know, I'm my favorite place, Newcomb's Ranch, and I was supposed to leave. I got in a conversation with someone. I knew I was possibly going to be late, but I can't text the guy. I can't email him. There's no range. As soon as I get to the bottom of the hill, I go, I think I might be running a few minutes late, 10, 15 minutes late, sending him an email like half an hour ahead to, you know, preemptively say, hey, I might be late. He's coming to my sure. place. Yeah. Anyway, miracle of whatever. I ended up getting there like five minutes early. Long story short, I wasn't late. But for me, I always try and make the effort if I know to say, hey, I got technology, right? This phone now works. I've come down the mountain. I'm off the hill. I've got reception. Let me pull over because I hate trying to email and text, and I don't want to be that guy. So I pull over, get out the phone, email him. Hey, I'm going to be late. And then arrived on arrived early. So that's kind of me. I 
I try to be try and be early wherever I go. That's my story. Yeah. Well, Timing's you were important. that today, so we, we greatly appreciate that, appreciate even that. though we were technically very technically <laughs> late. <laughs> but... You could have some more questions. You just asked me one, and we rambled on about aesthetics of watches. <laughs> well, listen, uh, I think that that rambling conversation that we just had was a fantastic That's one. Uh, look, at the end of the day, like a lot of people, when, when it comes to watches, either take things very, very seriously, like way too seriously, yeah, yeah. or just have, try to have a good time with and it. That and that can be intimidating, though, right? You right. Know, people like all this knowledge about, oh, it's reference 75. I'm like, what is he on about? You know, what is it? You know, this reference number yeah. and the I guess the minutiae of details, I get it. People get into it. But from an outsider's point of view, for me, it's like, do I like the way it looks? It's, I mean, what is the performance of a watch? I don't know. I can tell you what the performance is of a Porsche 911 from the base model to sure. the whatever top range model and what the difference is. But, yeah. you know... You know, it's it's not so much about performance anymore. It's uh, it similar it similar to the old vehicles. You know, you can buy a new vehicle right off the lot, and it's going to be far faster, far more powerful, far far more quiet inside. All right. of these little details that they've measured to right. make everything so perfect. But with a with an older car, you know, it, I it's the you. fun. The fun is there. I get That's it. That's what what you can think of, and for me watches it's about fun what is this whole new trend of uh sun faded dials and what do you call that uh what they call them ghost bezels or yeah. patina or Not patina, uh, tropical patina tropical, tropical dial, dial. Tropical yeah. dial. Yeah. tell me yeah. about tropical dial. Uh, I so think, uh, well, tropical dial yeah. i have a great example um i have an old rolex that i basically brought back to life it was what a watchmaker uh, 20 years ago said this is not worth anything it's it this is a parts the <laughs> equivalent it. of a parts vehicle <laughs> got it it's a parts roller so it got to the point where it needed a lot of work i put it back together and it had a lot more patina a very very tropical dial that i didn't really like i didn't connect with it so i Swap found dials. a different dial and i swapped it you keep the patina i kept tropical the patina dial. one uh. but i don't wear it that way cuz it's not my style you know i don't like the look of it it was too far gone um, but basically it's saying that this watch lived a full life, right. you know, it, it had all of these things, maybe, a. how does a tropical dial come about though? Is it something in the finish? Is it the, it's the starts, phosphorus that was on the luminous hand or what is it? You what have multiple, it? uh, things that go into it. First, most recognizable is going to be the loom. You're going to have radium loom. You're going to have tritium loom, and then you're going to have super luminova. See, I don't even know what that means. I, radium, I'm already lost. Very radioactive, glows because it's radioactive. Yeah. Um, so there's radioactive tropical dial watches. Oh, yeah. You can yeah. literally put a Geiger counter on it, and it'll go off. Those ones are very rare. Are and they quite, dangerous? Quite dangerous, yeah. Uh, you should be careful if you have those in your collection. Um, then you've got tritium, which is not nearly as radioactive, much safer. Uh, that's what you're going to find on a lot of these Rolexes. What era are these radioactively dangerous watches? 60s, 70s? Uh, those earlier, are going to be earlier. Yeah. Those are going to be like... Uh, 40s, 50s? 40s, 50s. Uh, yeah, 40s. Um, so those ones, a lot of that is is gone, you know, and there wasn't a lot of it to begin with. But uh, you have the tritium dials. Those ones are going to turn to a, a creamier color, kind of like on there, on okay. those uh, gauges right there. I like those. See how those got creamy? Yeah. They would have started white. Yeah. Uh, then you're also going to have earlier versions of Superluminova, which is not radioactive. That will also patina um, and kind of darken. Then you've got your dial, which is going to either be a paint or a varnish, maybe painted and varnished. Um, or you're going to have an electro um, electrochemical process to coat it. Those things will fade. You will end up with spider cracks on the varnish or you'll end up with uh faded um electrochemical coatings on there so like Audemars Piguet Jumbo Royal Oak the original one started with a very bluish gray color and a lot of them it faded off and it turned you can see the brass underneath um so that would be a tropical dial or you have your Rolex where the black turned to brown that's going to be a tropical dial as well you're also going to have the blue dials, which went purple for those blue dialed subs. Um, and a lot of times that's from somebody who actually wore it. The people that didn't wear it very often or only wore it in their office under a suit cuff, it didn't go tropical. So the a guy tropical who was dial out sailing, was someone that wore it. 
Yeah, the guy who was out on his boat sailing or scuba diving all the time wearing his Rolex sub, yeah. that Cousteau one went stuff. tropical. So I think that's where the tropical, got it, because uh, it had to get UV sunlight. Um, that's going to be the main place you see it. Is that also a recent, bezels. Is that a recent trend, though, of people searching for tropical dials? Pretty recent. The, f the first I can remember of being interested in a tropical dial was, uh, that'd be like, early 2000s i found out that the blue two-tone uh blue dial two-tone rolex sub from a certain era the first ones that they were doing they turned this funky purple the dials um turned this funky purple and i was really into that i wanted one i couldn't get one um but i really wanted one because of that just to be different rolex unique. knew of it early on and they started swapping the dials when they came in for service. So Got even it. if it hadn't changed color, they'd swap. they'd swap it. And the customer would never know. And the customer would never know. Um, so they're they're pretty rare. You'll start seeing more of them come to market now that everyone's very interested in tropical dials. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that are you seeing fake tropical dial manufacturer yes, patina? Yes, yet? absolutely. Yeah. How, how's that process aged? Uh, so the dial I put on my rolex has aged loom so it looks like the creamy colored loom but the dial is perfect the paint is perfect everything's there and nice looking but it has aged loom it's just a pigment that they add to the loom to to make it look like it naturally aged that Go way ahead. from sun um i haven't seen dials where they turn them brown or anything like Good. that um, not baking them in the oven they, uh, they, they oh, have. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't yeah. surprise me if people <laughs> are. I have seen the aluminum bezels that go into the, the old Rolexes. Those bezels, people will take and they'll put them into acid solutions. Yeah, right. Throw them and in a tumbler. Go get them, creative, basically. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So those will go from black to a gray. How much truth is it to the story that in the 70s, I heard, I guess no one cared about Rolex Daytona. Dealers had new old stock they couldn't sell, could practically not give them away. -ish. There's a lot of truth to that. And now all of a sudden, you know, we all know Paul Newman, right? 18 yeah. million or whatever it was. Well, think about it this way. When you think of Rolex, what do you think of? You think of the, the iconic shapes, right? And then the Cyclops. And the Daytonas never had the Cyclops. Yeah. So that's kind of one of the arguments as to why maybe Daytonas didn't sell so well. And they were kind of expensive, too. You know, so why is it such a desirable watch today? Uh, I think Rolex, Rolex is one of those things where you, it's, it's just, it just has to do with rarity and i do this in quotes yeah. because really rolex isn't that rare yeah uh hoyers are far more rare than right. than like siffert's or orange boys or, or watches that were kind of in the same era Joe are Siffert. far far more rare than anything that is a daytona including you know paul newman like panda dials or, or, or watches of that kind of sort uh but with rolex i think number one again i think it goes back to the branding and number two is Rolex is so common, but people want to be, they want to feel special. So what are you going to do or what, how are you going to try to individualize yourself or you're going to look for something that is different than someone else. It might be the same watch, but it patinaed a little bit different. And it's got this, you know, what you guys were talking about, a tropical dial or a ghost bezel or just bezels in, in general, like the blueberries, the blueberry GMTs with the all blue bezel, uh, the uh, bake lights, uh, things of that sort. I mean, yeah, those are a little rare, but... Are people wanting gold Rolexes today? It's it's, it's becoming they are. yeah it's yeah it's now gold Rolexes are coming. This has back. come yeah. back. This seems very eighties. Two tones. Right? Nobody wanted two tones. Like, so like yeah. gold yeah. Rolex with a blue uh, dial. I mean, is is that something someone wants? Right now, yes, yeah. yeah. Well, and I think what happened was stainless went crazy. Everyone wanted the stainless sport models, right? And people weren't into the gold, so the stainless prices started going up, and the gold prices stayed the same. And you'll find that if you're looking for a vintage Rolex, you're going to pay more for, for the vintage stainless than, than you would, you would for, for the gold. Right. So if if you if you want to wear a gold watch, now's a good time. Who wants a Hoya <laughs> Monaco today or Monaco? I mean, is that a desirable newer watch? newer vintage though? Vintage. I mean, I say Hoya, not Tag Hoya. Yeah. To me, it's two different things. Is it two? It different is. Things? Yeah. So, so the original. Different. So that's a Hoya. Popular watch. The new Tag Heuer reissue. The new Monaco. ones very available. Yeah, I haven't seen one worn in a very very long time. A contemporary Tag Heuer Monaco. So what? Where's the Steve McQueen Le Mans Heuer Monaco? Who has that? Somebody. I mean, we we know he wore it in the film, <laughs> yeah. right? Wasn't that the Joe Siffert yeah, connection? That, I don't know if that's ever uh, come up in auction. 
or anything I mean, like that. Only referencing that against the Paul Newman, right? Yeah. Just, I went to that place in New York and looked at the uh, Marlon Brando Apocalypse Now Rolex that, you know, was a fraction of yeah. Paul Newman Rolex, right? right? Yeah. I mean, the the Paul Newman one was very special. Um, I guess, yeah, but again, two, though, right? it's, it's that an amazing. The only one. Yeah, that was not the one. That yeah. was the one he gave away. Right. <laughs> so, right. You know, so who's yeah. got the Steve McQueen Lamont Hoyer then? I guess we need to find yeah. that out, right? Yeah, and you know, with with the number of watches that a company like Rolex has made over the years, and the number of clients they've had, there are endless possibilities to own your unique Rolex that is your. You that know, that leads me to a question. Then, in the Porsche world, you know, there's a Cardex. It's a birth certificate mm -hmm. of your Porsche, up to a certain year, and they don't give these out. You kind of, you know, know someone or you got it 20 years ago or. You sneak into the archive yeah. at the museum or whatever it is. I heard Rolex used to do that. Like my cousin would tell me, you know, because he buys and sells vintage watches. He's in Switzerland, right? He's got an antique shop, blah, blah, blah. He told me he could always find out, you know, what year, what. Because some what used to annoy me, and even happened with my Speedmaster, want to buy a watch. What year is it? Oh, we don't really know. It could be 72, could be 73. Like, you can't find this out. And so I, I guess at Rolex you could, but now you can't. So watches don't really have a year because the year models of manufacture though. So they have the final assembly and sale date right. usually. Um, but what you're going to find with watches is that the case might have been manufactured in '62, the movement was manufactured in '64, the case they had in in storage do, for many years. Do you have years. some cases from 2019? You probably do. Um, right? uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. And a 2020 movement. All of all of the watches that we're selling for 2020 are going to be 2019 cases. You know, right. um, so that happened a lot. But with the watch industry and all the different suppliers that they had back then, you're going to find that not only you might have two suppliers for a certain part. So those parts might even be slightly different. But there's a day it left the factory, right? The day it left and the factory. And got shipped to a store. Not the day that it might have got shipped to the store wherever and sat in a case for two years before someone bought yeah. it. But it left and the factory have, on a certain day And they'll have that in boys. their ledgers, but they might not open that to yeah, you. Yeah, got it. Um, one very neat thing about Rolex is that if you were the original owner of that Rolex... Rolex will actually work on your watch, no matter how old it is, hmm. which is amazing. How do you prove amazing. that, though? they got a it's record, and you've got the box and paper. You'd have to have the, the record and be able to prove that it was yeah. your family that purchased it in right. the beginning. So they want to keep those historical pieces. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you get more information from them that It's way. kind of hard to keep yeah. that, you know. I didn't keep the box and paper from my <laughs> iPhone. Right. <laughs> now, I have a record. Of what? Of every single watch that we've made, okay. Every day, every watch that the day it shipped out, the serial number, and the client that purchased it knew. So I have that record. I don't open it up for anyone, but I wanted to have that so, because that kind of thing is important to me. How does someone acquire this watch? It's sold online? You go to you go to a watch shop. I mean, how do you buy? Sold online. Watch? That's it. You you could go to a few stores throughout the world. Do you wholesale? I guess is my question. We do wholesale to a few stores. Very small part of our business. Okay. Most of our sales are, are direct. Okay. On the internet um, or via phone, directly ordering the watch from us. I we have a check waiting period website. to even get one. There's a waiting period. Yeah. Yeah. There's about, I see it's, a lot of it's cases not like a, a stainless steel Rolex. Um, How long is the waiting list today? About six, six weeks okay. to eight weeks. Okay. Yeah. And at this point, is there any customization? Let's, you know, say, hey, I, I dig this, but there's always a but, right? You know, it's like the guy that walks into the restaurant. It's like one of my scenes in Get Shorty, Danny DeVito, right? Goes to the fancy, the ivy or whatever it is and doesn't eat anything on the menu. It has to have something yeah. specially made by the chef. Is there any customization? To I do? rarely do customization. You said rarely. You didn't rarely. say never. So yeah. I, I've got a separate list of all the customized watches I've done, and there's about 10 on there. Okay. So it's it's pretty rare. That's rarefied water. Yeah. Okay. I'll bear that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What else we got to talk about? Uh, we're about an hour and a half in, so, so we should probably wrap. This. 
Yeah. Still says ten past ten. I've been watching. Right? That thing. I, th- I think these might need a watch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someone or needs to wind those yeah. or shake them up. It's very strategic yeah. to, to well, put them up there as well. Yeah, yeah. Time yeah. flies when you're talking watches it, or having it really fun. Does. As oh well, thank you. Well, we're having <laughs> fun I, so I, far. Let's hope I, it's I recorded. Guess I can speak on your behalf as well. I think you're having fun. It looks like you're having fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love this. Laugh a minute. Right. I mean, <laughs> I'm just cramming all these timing references in here. Okay, this is going to be a good, very referenced show. Yeah. Well, we can stop the watch whenever you want. We can. We can. We've got plenty of chronographs here. We can stop the chronograph that's function. True. Yeah, yeah. That's Do you true. have any other questions, Cameron? No, I mean, I... I beard advice. I learned a lot. I, yeah, could I get some beard advice? <laughs> <laughs> Don't shave. Don't shave. Yeah. That's my advice. Stay that's healthy. very sound advice. Yeah. That's my goal for the year. Grow, grow a longer beard. Okay. It's actually getting shorter, but I'm not cutting it. I've seen photos from five years ago when it's physically longer. Yeah. And I guess you do have to groom your beard. breaks off, huh? Split ends. Yeah, I'm right. getting older. Hair's yeah. probably not quite as thick or healthy. Maybe I need collagen. Who knows, right? Collagen for my split ends. I don't know. Well, we don't have any of those advertisers yet. You know, like, what are those companies? Uh, yeah. We the ones that those. I'm not even going to say them. Yeah, we don't need those. <laughs> we, yeah, exactly. All so right, I, well, we've anyway, talked about brands enough, right? Yeah. I mean, I think people got to hop on Crown and Caliber and find some watches. Um, for sure. Got to watch I, and I listen, like, importantly, right? Right. I like what you were saying about, you know, buying what speaks to you, what you and love. it's not about you know what everybody else is going after right, right. now super valid point yeah. people randomly email me all the time i got one the other day guy sends me an email thinking of buying a car gives me the, the the four cars that he's thinking of buying which one do i think he should get and of course it's all the obvious stuff it's like it's, it's this annoyance for me like Got to watch, got to be a Rolex, right? So yeah. the average Porsche question, I'm thinking of buying a GT2, a GT3, a GT3 RS. Which one should I buy? So I replied, I'm just driving whichever one you're connected to, buy that one. It's not a status symbol for me. Yeah. Buy what you love, acquire what you love, beg, steal, borrow, trade, whatever it is, right? Barter, whatever it is. Just get what you personally like is always my motto. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds that, like we're all on the same page. That's how I am with the watches. Yeah. It's it's not always a collection that will impress those people. Yeah, I don't do it for that. You know, but you will have that person every once in a while who is like, wow, why did you buy that one? Yeah. You know, and they're really intrigued by that. And that is exciting to explain like, well, I bought it because of this little weird right. thing that I really liked and nobody else seems to care about. Yeah. But All right. Yeah. I don't yeah. own a Fender. I don't own a Ferrari. Uh, I don't own a Rolex, but I own a Porsche. I own an Omega and I own a... Hoya, so that's uh, and I own some Gibsons, so pick yeah. your poison. Well, have fun. It sounds like you like the things more. that you have, so yeah, it's what you got to live for, right? Yeah, I guess should we leave it at that? Let's leave it. Yeah. At that. Okay. Well, Magnus, please let people where they can uh, let people know where they can find you. Well, find me on Instagram, Magnus Walker, or find me driving around, man with a beard behind the wheel of a Porsche. My motto: get out and drive. Yes. Yes, Cameron. Find me on Instagram as well, uh, Cameron M Weiss for my Instagram, or follow Weiss Watch Company. Uh, to see more watchmaking. Cool. Cool deal. You can find me on Instagram as well, Road Stories Mike. Uh, and also, since we did some car conversations today, you can actually go back and listen to some of my old podcasts called Road Stories Podcast. Uh, and we've got people very much like you, Magnus, that came on and talked about cars and their passion for them. And Sounds good to me. Yeah. If you've yeah. got too much time on your hands, guys, just tune into uh, any of those Instagrams or listen to those podcasts. That's uh, right. That's right. All right, guys, roll. make sure to visit Crown and Caliber. If you are looking for a previously enjoyed watch, I remember like uh, the, enjoyed, the motto. I like that. I like yes. that. Over owned, enjoyed. The motto of the show: Buy what you like, enjoy it. Don't buy it as an investment. Don't buy it if you're trying to improve or impress someone. You're never gonna impress. Someone's always gonna have something better than you. <laughs> so it's like this is the world that we live in, you know. True. So enjoy um, what you like. Like what you enjoy. Love the one you're with. Love the one you're with, exactly. That's <laughs> why like I send it on that note. Love the one you're with. That's right. Okay. Well, with that being said, everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. We apologize for the technical difficulties. We will get it fixed. I am determined to get everything fixed. But Perfection yeah. takes time. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, guys. Remember to subscribe also. So cheers. Cheers, gentlemen. Rock and roll. Thanks a lot. All right. Awesome. <laughs>